Um, so a short talk on modeling melt bearing systems, a uh, little bit of introduction, a little bit of theory, and this will bridge quite well to what Dave Patterson was just talking about, um, followed by a few pictures of uh, real rocks in the field. So we get some feeling for the physical behavior of melt bearing system because it, um, it, it, it will be relevant. Um, <clears throat> And then um, three little um, collections of uh, examples of forward modeling of migmatites, some water saturated and uh, some with uh, dehydration melting features. And then uh, dealing with melt loss in ways that we were touching on in the discussions just now. And there, there will be a recipe in there, um, which is subject to some of Dave Patterson's caveats, but it, uh, it might be helpful for us to use. <clears throat> so um, just starting with a, Diagram is based on one from Thompson and, uh, and, uh, and Algor, a simple bundle of reactions. Um, and uh, the, the idea with that is that um, um, it's, um, uh, oh, that's the one I'm sharing, hang on. This is getting a bit complicated here because I'm trying to read my notes at the same time. Um, uh, where basically, wherever a subsolidus dehydration reaction meets the solidus for the relevant bulk composition, um, you will have a situation like we have, hang on, find a laser pointer, um, situation like we have uh, on the left hand side here. Um, here's a subsolidus uh, dehydration reaction, it's drawn from muscovite here. Um, this is the wet solidus, and what that does is generate some other curves which are incongruent melting curves, but one of those is the vapor absent dehydra dehydration melting curve for that particular hydrous assemblage. And, um, uh, so we're, we've seen a collection of those uh, already in Dave Patterson's diagram, and uh, it so happens that I've got uh, essentially the same diagram here, average P light, it's uh, from the White et al. 2001 um, uh, uh, first uh, melting paper. And on here, our simple diagram has turned into, essentially into bands, uh, uh, they're relatively low variance um, reactions that, um, that, uh, that, that, that you can see forming bands across here and if we label them up a little bit more then you can see there's a there's a muscovite um, absent dehydration melting well a, a muscovite a dehydration melting reaction um, a biotite dehydration melting one and um, uh, in uh, with an aluminium silicate and a biotite dehydration melting that will lead to formation of orthoproxene with cordialite so um, uh, we also need to be aware that there is actually dehydration melting going on in these intervening fields as well. And that's for a reason that, that Dave also mentioned, which is the water content of the melt. Um, this is, if you like, a map of water contents across the um, water saturated and then water undersaturated solidus surface all the way up to uh, dry melting here. And so as the water content of the melt decreases, its volume will increase to compensate because we're in a fixed amount of water. Uh, system when we're doing this. Um, okay, um, into some pictures. Uh, these are really just to give us some idea of um, how melt might be produced in certain places and then maybe migrate and accumulate. And of course, some of it will uh, uh, potentially exit the rock. So we've got a stromatic magmatite with leucosomes that essentially have melt composition, the lens cap uh, scale. Um, and uh, so that's a uh, no, local migration. There may have been melt uh, lost from the rock as a whole. Uh, that's probably wet melting. That's probably water saturated melting in that case. These other um, examples are uh, dehydration melting here, perhaps the very beginning of dehydration melting with melt appearing to um, effectively nucleate or, or start growing adjacent to, uh, uh, to garnets, uh, pre-existing garnets because there are more elsewhere. <clears throat> And uh, not very much melt produced here, and so very, very, very likely there's very little uh, movement of melt um, in that rock system. But as soon as we get continuous neosomes here, I'm calling them neosomes because they've got the peritectic melt products, solid melt pro products of the melting reaction in them, as well as producing melt. But you can get the feeling that there are domains in here, down here, and this one here which are coarse and leucocratic and essentially have the composition of melt. So we're beginning to get separation of um, melt from the um, residual solids. Um, other parts in here, this is, uh, uh, this is, if you like, the original assemblage. This is the, the reactant side of the dehydration melting reaction, still um, you know, partly re um, preserved in some way in the rest of the matrix. 
Um, here we've got a big sheet of uh, Luca granite, effectively. There are garnets in it. And so you can argue this is melt that's found a way out. It's migrated in a, in a sheet-like form, and it's entrained some of those ferrotectic crystals with it. Um, at the smaller scale, I wanted, to, I wanted to put this one in. This is a thin section mapped out by Ed Sawyer in his 2001 paper, in which um, he has looked for uh, these little intergranular mineral films that can be interpreted as uh, pseudomorphing the trap melt. And in this domain of his thin section, um, he uh, maps out 6% of those. They're pretty much isolated just down here. It looks like they're uh, becoming interconnected. At 12%, it looks like there's more interconnection. In this zone here in the middle where there's quite a lot of melt, then you would reckon that all of that um, interstitial melt there is interconnected in three dimensions. That's a contact metamorphic rock. So without deformation, um, uh, it's, it's not inconceivable that you could, uh, you could store melt in the rocks. Um, looking at some of these other field photos, we're in, uh, we're in uh, mafic rocks here now. And um, here is one with big ferrotectic peroxines in. You can see the dark orthoperoxines, but also the light green planar peroxine in here. There's a little bit of domain there with sort of trondromitic composition, but there doesn't seem to be enough melt in here to account for the ferrotectic product. So melt has probably gone here. And in other outcrops in the neighborhood, you'll find these interconnected um, neosomes here that are potential pathways for moving the melt around. Another example here from West Greenland, where there's also been some deformation and some boudinage and some necking, and it looks like the melt wanted to form or, uh, or, or congregate in these uh, in boudin necks, and there's also a network of uh, potential pathways for moving melt around. Um, so it seems that melt can move. If it doesn't and it builds up, then in principle, you could reach a point which the uh, the, the rock um, loses its uh, uh, its coherence. So you above some critical melt fraction, which people reckon is maybe thirty to fifty volume percent, then um, that can lead to convective instability. And then basically, you're talking about a magma rather than the rock. Okay, let's get down to the phase diagrams then. <clears throat> um, so uh, first off, here we've got um, approaches. Um, to modeling involving forward modeling. And uh, we've already seen the one from the P-Light. Um, so here is uh, melting of, uh, of Meta Grey Wackies from Johnson et al. 2008. And the solidus is here. Um, and so this is the super solidus region. These are uh, um, uh, diagrams calculated for the fixed amount of melt fixed somewhere on the solidus, just as Dave described um, earlier. Um, here you'll notice so that the melt volume contours show really rather small fractions um, in this uh, uh, region uh, just above the solidus. And it's only until you get further over that uh, in this case, you meet a, um, a band through here, which is evidently an important biotite dehydration melting reaction. Uh, it's labeled R3 on here. <clears throat> and in fact, that's the reaction that eventually eliminates biotites. We get into large melt fractions over this side of the diagram. Um, if you look at a similar one for melting of mafic rocks, this is uh, melting of mafic rocks with the latest mafic models, Palin et al. in 2016, it's for a, 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 a morb composition. Again, we've got the uh, 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 water saturated solidus here, and we've got a um, so super solidus region here with, uh, with melt contours on. And you'll see that um, that that's they seem to involve a fairly steady increase with temperature. It's it's steady. It's but it's accelerating somewhat as we get to higher temperatures here, um, and they we don't seem to have the marked boundaries of uh, discrete dehydration reactions um, here as we had in in, in the pelite, which is kind of interesting. Um, and a lot of what we see here is simply the change in meltwater content, and you'll also notice here the. Uh, really quite extreme persistence of hornblende to high temperature. So in, in uh, uh, Richard's uh, uh, simplified diagram here, you can see there are hornblende bearing granulites that go up to really rather high temperatures, 1000 degrees or so. Uh, okay, looking now with an eye to uh, back of P-lights here, but looking uh, with an eye to considering uh, PT path dependence of melting processes. Um, uh, this is a Himalayan example. In a moment, there'll be another Himalayan example on the right. Um, this is uh, work by Groppo et al. from 2012, uh, a nice um, uh, analysis of the kind of things that can go on. When in a collisional belt, you might expect there to be some kind of uh, you know, uh, clockwise prograde PT path. And um, 
there's um, muscovite dehydration melting here, R1, and then this reaction band R2 is the main biotite dehydration um, um, melting reaction in this particular system. And you can see that they're going to be rather different results depending on the rock at any moment is falling path one or path two or path three or path four. Um, easy enough that we're increasing um, melting uh, in path one and also in part two with some exhumation. But once we're at a stage where we're running parallel to the isoplast, then, um, then, then obviously we're not going to generate uh, any, any more melt. And also bear in mind that dehydration melting is an endothermic process. So um, uh, in path four, evidently, then our melts are, are tending to crystallize at that stage. Um, down here, we can see cordurite bearing assemblages weren't uh, relevant to this particular point here, but they will be in a moment. You see that sort of zigzag pattern there has its own implications. Um, so we moved to Nangaparbat for this example, Crowley et al. 2009, with a clockwise path. And the melting here in these migmatites would have been created in this same region up here, after Muscovite melting and in this field. Um, but the rest of the path comes down through here, and it goes through this field here where the melt fraction is decreasing. And that's largely because the garnet in the system here is being replaced by cordurite. And so this is uh, garnet, this is backscattered electron image garnet being replaced by cordurite, shape of the garnet still evident. And cordurite being a hydrous mineral, it's taking the water out of the melt, enhancing crystallization, such that in some compositions like this right hand one, uh, this, this will freeze uh, perhaps earlier than you might have expected. If, however, we are looking at a melt which is partly separated, a leucogranitic melt can carry on and uh, uh, may, may well not uh, solidify until it reaches its, its own um, uh, solidus um, down, down here near the, uh, um, uh, near, near, near the, near the uh, water saturated or at the water saturated solidus um, for a leucogranite. Um, in this particular case, that what allowed us to do with this varying behavior was to get a detailed chronology of melt evolution, crystallization on the exhumation path for these um, remarkably young migmatites uh, uh, on the order of a million years old and uh, uh, exposed at the surface now. Um, so, um, okay, uh, migmatites is something we're gonna focus on for next, uh, next slide or two. Um, I've got a couple of examples here. This first one shows uh, so calculated contrasts between water saturated and dehydration melting. This is a paper by Drup and Brody. This is the Etivoreol in Scotland, and that which uh, cropped up in an earlier presentation. Um, but here's the melting behavior. Um, they also considered and reckoned they could see the effects of H2O transfer from some lithologies into others. And so they felt they had a mix of both dehydration melting and fluid present melting. And here is what you expect to see with dehydration melting. We kind of had hints of this before. Wet solidus is here, but we, nothing very much happens until we meet a significant um, dehydration melting reaction for muscovite in this case, and we'll increase the melt um, volume over quite a short interval. And then after that's finished and the muscovite's gone, it will level off again. Some other process will take over. A difference between quartz bearing and quartz absent rocks when they hit the solidus here, but the overall shapes and, and trends are, are, are pretty similar. On the other hand, if you have got um, uh, excess um, uh, H2O, and if it's being delivered from adjacent rocks, then you'll get this big pulse of melt earlier. And note the change in scale here, we're getting potentially, although as, as Dave pointed out, perhaps not realistically, up to 70% by volume of melt in, uh, in systems like this, if there's excess fluid to start with. Again, there's a difference between quartz bearing and quartz absent, but even the quartz absent rocks, we can um, potentially melt large volumes of them if there's lots of excess fluid. <coughs> Okay, second example is in the dehydration melting regime. Um, but I put it in part because it's a, it's a nice example of very early kind of melting that, um, that, that we could even attempt in the early 1980s. Um, this, is, um, uh, this, this was um, a, a product of reading um, Alan Thompson's 1982 paper um, on the, uh, his prediction of the melting sequence with bulk composition in metapelites, arguing that um, that somewhat more iron rich ones might melt um, before the uh, before more magnesium ones. And as it happens, about a month after first reading that paper, I was out in the field with a colleague and we found a series of outcrops which almost perfectly predicted the things he was saying in that paper. So this Waters and Wales is the paper that resulted from that. 
Um, this uh, diagram is uh, calculated mineral compositions, garnet down the side, biotite in the middle, cordierite on the right hand side, at fixed pressure, fixed temperature. So it's water activity versus uh, XMG uh, in, in the minerals, essentially. And um, so if we label it up a little bit, you'll see there's a, a change in assemblage here, which is that biotite, sunlight, quartz, dehydration, melting reaction. Um, and then the black blobs and the tie lines here are the mineral compositions in unmelted uh, cordurite bearing schists over here, um, and uh, our partially melted garnet cordurite nice, which you saw a picture of um, uh, a few slides ago down here. And that makes the point that um, the melting process can occur in certain rocks within an interbanded sequence. So these are only a sort of meter, couple of meters apart from each other. Um, and that the water activity in the melted rock um, is defined at a much lower value than uh, what you find in the unmelted rocks. So that's got um, um, potential um, uh, implications for what might be happening. You've got chemical potential gradients there and you could get um, things happening uh, with, uh, with, uh, um, uh, by virtue of that. Um, right, okay, more on migmatites, this time um, uh, for slightly more up-to-date modeling. Um, this is a way around the sort of issue that that um, that, that uh, Dave was uh, uh, was talking about in the previous uh, uh, previous talk, um, because the uh, environment in the subsolidus is different from the environment in the supersolidus with respect to water. You can partly get around this by modeling with uh, with Theriac if you, for example, fractionate water as you go along a path. And uh, that's essentially what I've done in diagram A here, simulate um, dehydration melting. After the first step or so, you've got rid of the, uh, that excess water. You can cross the solidus safely and you can watch the dehydration melting begin. Um, small amount at first, as we saw with the, uh, with the Ativoreol. Um, and then you hit the uh, uh, interval of that uh, uh, major Muscovite dehydration melting reaction. The li uh, liquid uh, uh, amount of uh, melt increases. Um, the, uh, your muscovite disappears, um, and then uh, after that point, then this is essentially biotite dehydration melting. You see the little bit of increase in garnet as a product. K feldspar has appeared, um, and so on. On we go. Um, if you do that in excess, that's diagram B down here. You'll see uh, once again, as we saw, this enormous increase in um, melt production. Uh, again, we've had to change the scale here, and we end up at 770 here, with again about 70% of melt. And uh, that's unlikely to be realistic uh, for various uh, uh, reasons that we've set out before. Uh, what you can do there, if you're interested in maybe modeling a more realistic system in which uh, the water is in, um, at, at least accessing the system or in excess, is then fractionate melt. And so that's what I've done in diagram C here um, with uh, a little uh, driver file here, as Doug calls them, um, in, in, in Theriac, where we are removing 90% of the melt at each step, and we're doing 50 steps between 670 and 770. And what we see here then is uh, our rock retaining just a small fraction of that melt that's being generated. And we're really looking at how this residue becomes more refractory as that melt is fractionated away. So more garnet, more silimonite, less plagioclase, less biotite. So those are kind of the games you can play. Um, okay, um, uh, third set of examples. This finally, in a way, this is the nitty gritty. This is something that you might conceivably be able to use as a recipe. It's an approach that's explained in more detail than I can do now in the uh, Nepal Metamorphic Review paper, that's orders 2019. And the way you can start, if you, uh, you know, it's not an uncommon problem. You've got, a, you've got a rock, it's a migmatite or granulite. You think it may have lost melt. And you say, well, can I determine peak conditions or how much of that earlier history can I retrieve? And uh, uh, yes, there are, um, uh, there, 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 are, there are doubts and things that you need to be aware of, as, as Dave was saying about that, but um, let's see if this works. One thing you can do is just look at the rock as it, essentially as it is now, or essentially as you believe it was when it became a closed system after losing that last fraction of melt. Um, and then um, you can infer that at that peak, the current assemblage was essentially at its solidus. Um, it might have a bit of retrograde uh, 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 overprint in it that you might want to account for uh, if 
particularly if that uh, affects the water content of the rock as you now see it, but um, let's take it as it is. If, however, there's actually evidence in your rock um, that some melt has been retained, so these intergranular melt films or leucosome patches, then you can place your peak the you know, uh, relevant amount higher than the solidus. But the solidus itself then on a diagram like this is a constraint that you can, uh, you can hope to use. In this case, I've intersected the solidus with uh, um, with, with, with a garnet isopleth there. This was the same case I talked about uh, um, in, in, in a previous uh, uh, talk about um, uh, ab ab about retrograde um, uh, ion magnesium exchange. We might have to take that into account as well. Okay, so that takes you back to some estimate of the peak. If you want then to recalculate or, or, or try and estimate what the earlier history was, you then go back to this assumption that, you know, in all probability, this rock crossed the um, just H2O saturated solidus at some point, and it'll be up to you to decide what that point is. Um, with me, it was seven and a half kilobars here, partly because that matched what was happening in nearby rocks, and also because this rock contains some relic kyanite. Um, and so I wanted the melting to start just in the kyanite field. Um, if you then make a temperature X diagram, where X is the proportion of a suitable model melt, you can figure out where that position is. The, um, the, the blue area in here is water saturated assemblages, the red area is melt saturated assemblages, and the white is just solids uh, only. And if you can identify this point here, then that then becomes the point on the solidus. Uh, it defines an amount of melt to put back into your system, and it defines the water content that that system will have. So you calculate another diagram, and when you calculate that, you can put melt isopleths on it. You know where your best idea of the peak was, either on the on that original solidus or a bit above it, and then you can estimate some uh, uh, prograde history that will take you to that point. Um, so good luck with that if you want to try it. It will, I trust, um, sometimes work or more or less work. Um, last slide here, dealing uh, still with melt loss, um, is um, what happens if you have some retained melt in your system and you want to know what that might do while things are cooling? There's a possibility for retrograde reactions. Um, this is uh, melt loss from Johnson & Johnson. It was the simplest diagram I could find and this particular example got up to about 900 and produced 30% of melt. And so this diagram is temperature um, isobaric at seven kilobars showing the proportion of that 30% of melt that gets lost and showing in here then what would happen at any given amount of retained melt um, to your system as it cooled. And just, just for the hell of it, I've chosen um, the, uh, to have 40% um, uh, of melt loss. So out of that 30, 18 volume percent has been retained. And as we cool from, 1900, from 900 or so here, we'll get biotite starting to form at this point here. And going down through this field, crossing the isopleths, we'll have biotite forming, garnet forming as well, in fact, in this case, orthoperoxine decreasing until we get to the solidus. And when we hit the solidus, pretty much everything will stop. We'll have less communication, so less ability to react. And in fact, the isopleths really aren't changing very much here anyway. And so during this interval is when we expect to see things happen. And as it happens, I've got a rock of my own, which shows effectively that same process. We've got the peritectic orthoperoxine, got garnet here. In this case, some of this is peritectic and some of it has grown on the retrograde path. And we've got the biotite here. And some of the biotite is blocky and some of it's skeletal. And that's really just showing the progress from um, being a lot of melt to being a smaller melt left in the system. And uh, so that would be an anal analogy for this. Um, in most cases, perhaps most of the melt would be left. And so that interval may be quite small and there may be relatively little of that kind of process. Okay, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. And so really I'm just closing with a, um, a list of uh, useful papers there. I see we, I see we are nearly at, at, uh, uh, at half past uh, um, nine, I think it is, Calgary time. Um, I think we've got, we've got maybe, one minute. Maybe, maybe this time for a quick question. Yeah, if we, we can ask one and then perhaps we can come back to some of the others in the lab in, uh, after the break. Um, so thanks very much, Dave. The first question was, uh, can we contour the composition of the liquid across the diagrams? And uh, what would be a good compositional variable to contour? So you showed lots of mode compositions, but um, how about the composition? 
Um, yes, no reason why you can't. Uh, I mean, I did those diagrams in Theriac, Dom Theriac Domino, um, and okay, I'm not plugging one program over another, but it, it is very easy to contour um, uh, things. Uh, if uh, the, okay, that's the uh, that's the melt model. Um, that's a Holland and Powell melt model, and so um, the trickiest part of that will be turning the contours you can generate that are in the uh, Holland and Powell defined um, composition uh, variables into real um, elements and oxide proportions that you might be interested in. That can be more tricky. You really will have to get inside the melt model and see how that's done. Uh, could you talk about the critical fractionation for melt loss? I often see seven to 10%, but this seems based on Rosenberg and Handy 2005 for high strain rate experiments. Um, image processing of migmatites suggests a fractionation more like 30% before the melt segregates. So could you talk about this uh, critical fractionation for melt loss? Yeah, I, I think there, there are two points here which we, we've got to be a bit clear about. One is often called a percolation threshold, um, which is the sort of interconnected porosity that will allow melt to move through something that's still, uh, no, st still a coherent rock. And then there's the um, critical melt fraction or rheologically critical melt percentage or various other names for it, which is the point at which uh, the, the grains in the rock are so separated that they lose coherence and, and then effectively you have a magma and it can convect. And, uh, you know, we, we really do want to distinguish between those two things because uh, um, uh, it's, it seems evident from a lot of the uh, simple field evidence and what you see in thin section like uh, um, like the, this um, uh, example um, of, uh, of Ed Sawyer's, um, where even at the thin section scale, um, if, you, uh, uh, if you accept that these sort of thin intergranular films are pseudomorphing what, what, what was melt, um, that um, sometimes they're um, isolated, sometimes they're interconnected, and that will just magnify up onto the sort of uh, you know, outcrop scale and allow melt to leave a rock without actually disrupting it too much. And uh, so, yeah, that sort of seven to 10 is where one might think the percolation threshold may be. And it'll vary according to you know, mineral type and whether there's deformation going on and, th and things of that nature. Um, and uh, then, you know, for the critical melt fraction that makes uh, uh, rocks incoherent, um, then, um, I think 30 to 50 volume percent, it, again, it, you know, you can't be, um, you can't be absolutely rigid because it'll depend on things like, uh, you know, mineral geometry, whether they make a, a rigid framework or not. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Dave. Um, another question here, you showed uh, Rich Palin's 2016 paper and his diagrams for modeling the melting in metabasites, I think. Uh, and someone asking, are there any other examples of modeling migmatites and melt loss in metabasites other than this paper? Um, um, <laughs> I, I don't doubt they are, but um, uh, I, I, I haven't got any on the top of my head anyway, but uh, they, they, they will be out there. People are modeling melts now. Um, I mean, a lot of those people are actually Richard Palin. Um, he's, you know, he's, uh, he's published quite a lot of papers where he's taken these melt models and used them to demonstrate all sorts of really interesting things, uh, particularly because he's got interested in the early, you know, history of the early Earth and whether melting processes uh, in some way will be different or produce different products uh, at different stages of Earth history. Um, and so in doing that, I'm sure, you know, if you chase those papers down, then you'll find that there's, uh, uh, there's some variety. Um, Plus, um, Jacob, I happen to know you've done quite a fair amount of that yourself. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and th no, th there will be published stuff out there. And if there isn't now, there will be more later. I think so. Yeah, that's a great answer, Dave. Go and, go and have a look at the go, go Google Scholar and look at this paper and which papers cite it. Um, because uh, there's, there's lots done by Richard and others using this new mount model that came out in 2016 um, that I think will, will give you an idea of other things. Uh, one last question, I'm going to use this as a kind of to connect in to the next the next talks. Uh, how does graphite affect these melting reactions that you show? And um, you can totally palm that off Mark and Doug. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, I know what migmatites with graphite in look like, and it's lovely graphite with nice big flakes. Um, the question is, of course, what's it doing to you know, anything in the um, 
uh, and, and anything carbon related uh, in terms of fluid. Um, I mean, CO2 doesn't dissolve very much in the melt itself. Um, it's very low solubility. Um, I mean, in my experience, I think I mentioned this earlier, actually, I think in my experience, what I've seen in a, a number of um, migmatites, including the Namakulan ones that I've obviously spent quite a lot of time with, um, is the evidence for um, you know, multi-phase fl fluid inclusions, implying that um, when you're melting, it's by no means impossible that there is a mixed fluid along with that. Um, and uh, you know, just, just looking at them, not done any thermometry or anything, you know, um, they, they look like they are um, mixed, you know, roughly 50-50, let's say, H2O, CO2. Um, and, you know, uh, it's perfectly um, viable that those are fluid inclusions um, that at the time were a fluid in equilibrium with the melt and with the solids, because if water activity is down around the 0 0.4, 0 0.5 mark, that is the kind of fluid that you might expect to be present. Um, so, uh, so I think that's always a possibility, graphite or no graphite, they may well be a mixed fluid in you know, small amounts in migmatites. 